recording? Yes. Great. Well, welcome everyone to this Observing with NASA's Universe of Learning uh, webinar. It was um, disseminated to many partners of NASA's Universe of Learning, including the StarNet libraries. I know many of you out there are StarNet libraries. Um, and uh, some folks who've participated in Girls Steam Ahead with NASA will tell you a bit about that today. And my name is Mary Dussault. I am a uh, program manager in the science education department at the uh, Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. And we are a partner to NASA's Universe of Learning, um, uh, which is headed up at the Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, where the that operates and uh, is the data center for the Hubble Space Science Telescope. And Carolyn Slavinsky is here with us from uh, Space Telescope. And also uh, one of your hosts here is Erica Wright, uh, also on camera, on screen. And she is here at the Center for Astrophysics and part of our microobservatory, NASA's uh, microobservatory team as well. So I'm going to share, actually, I'm going to end the poll and share the results here. It looks like the moon takes it as a favorite astronomical op uh, object among this group, um, with uh, lots of other things coming in, uh, uh, coming in behind. And of course, the recent news about that black hole has uh, put that um, up pretty far as well. OK. Well, today, uh, just so you guys know, here's where you're from. All the registrants uh, have uh, signed up from all over the country, so we appreciate you joining us today. And uh, our um, webinar today is brought to you by the uh, NASA's Universe of Learning. Whoops, somehow I, there we are. Which is a, um, an informal learning program around STEM that's funded by uh, NASA's science division. And it's all around, it involves many of the scientists and educators involved with NASA's astrophysics uh, missions. And the mission of NASA's Universe of Learning is to engage learners of all ages and backgrounds in exploring the universe for themselves. And so today, we are really hoping that um, we can show you some resources that are excellent at helping your audiences, you and your audiences, explore the universe for yourself. Uh, this particular webinar was initiated by the Girls Steam Ahead with NASA program of NASA's Universe of Learning. And I'm going to have Carolyn uh, Slavinsky just uh, say a little bit about that before we dive into telescopes and observing. I will. Good afternoon, everyone. Unless in Alaska, it's still the morning. I'm not sure. It kind of threw me off that we had three people from Alaska, but welcome to everybody. I just wanted to take a real short minute to talk about Girl Steam Ahead with NASA, or as we will abbreviate it because NASA loves an acronym, GSON, um, uh, about GSON and the many resources that are available to you to help with your program planning. Uh, it's focused on engaging girls and their families in field-tested, hands-on activities. And while it's aimed specifically at girls, it's uh, very family-friendly and uh, encourages all, all genders to attend these uh, things. But the resources have been particularly vetted to be effective at uh, helping girls to self-identify as scientists. Uh, we do rely on an extensive network. And all of you got uh, email invitations through one of those networks, some of the ones that uh, Mary mentioned earlier on. Our goal is to build STEM awareness, not only of the careers, but of that self-identity that I was talking about, so that girls can consider themselves scientists, not just, I would like to be a scientist, but actually be a scientist and do what scientists do. And one of the best examples of that is what Mary's gonna talk about today, with the micro observatory where you're going to use actual data. Uh, please uh, get in touch with us with the, the Girl Steam Ahead email address that's going to be provided to you. If you have any questions about resources uh, that you may want to utilize or any questions about the resources that we have, some of which are, are listed here. And I will go ahead and turn it back to Mary. Great, thanks Carolyn. 
Um, so one of the key signature efforts of NASA's Universe of Learning is to provide data tools and authentic experiences for learners to uh, really participate in being scientists, feeling what it's like to be a scientist. And today, the specific data tools and uh, uh, real um, astronomers uh, toolkit that we're gonna talk about are telescopes and digital images and image processing. So, uh, of course, telescopes these days, astronomers don't very much look through the eyepiece they, um, and they don't go to the telescope personally. Of course, it's hard to go to the uh, telescopes in space that NASA has. They control them over uh, the, by computer and uh, request their images that way. So we have a ground-based telescope system called Micro Observatory. There's a picture of it on the right there, which you and your audiences can control any day from the convenience of your uh, library, your uh, uh, classroom, your living room, your iPhone, uh, and request an image. And we're going to do that today. Actually, I do want to, um, I'm going to uh, launch a poll, another poll here, and uh, ask if um, people, will, I sent out an email the other day uh, asking you to try this out. And I just wanted to find out uh, if people were able to request an image through the microobservatory interface. And uh, if you, in fact, if you did that, if you did it by yesterday, a couple of hours ago, you should have received your um, email image. So we, it looks like a, a few people got to do that I, uh, uh, and have received their image. A couple of people haven't received their image, but did request one, and uh, probably more people just haven't had a chance to request that image yet. So that's good to know, and we'll go through that right now. Okay, so um, these are the same, what we're gonna learn today are the same skills that uh, if you're gonna make an observation using the Hubble Space Telescope, you have to know how to do, or any of NASA's uh, astrophysics missions in space. And uh, we're gonna do that right now. Um, so this is the agenda for the day. We're gonna introduce you to the telescopes, introduce you to what to do with those images when they come back from the telescopes, because uh, uh, telescopes these days, the, the images they send back are at first a file of numbers. And you have to use image processing software to, to uh, work with those numbers and turn them into pictures and then we'll uh, do a little advanced image processing using making a what's called a natural color image um, that actually is representative of the colors that objects in space are really glowing um, and then the, our last agenda item for the day is to make sure you know about NASA's astrophoto challenges which are seasonal opportunities uh, to um, once your audiences learn how to use microobservatory and the image processing software, they can uh, submit the results of their work, of their image processing work, and have it uh, reviewed by the NASA's Universe of Learning team, and it might be highlighted on our website. So we'll find out about that at the end. Um, all right, so. The microobservatory network is um, automated. You can control it. There's no human in the loop. We have a couple of telescopes in Arizona at the Smithsonian's Whipple Observatory. The, this image on the right here is one of our telescopes on the roof where Erica and I are sitting in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and in order to request an image from these telescopes, uh, oh, I. Sorry, before we request an image, just so you know, they, they actually have a very similar design to the Hubble Space Telescope. There's a big mirror, there's a big opening for light to come in, there's a big mirror in the back, light is focused from that mirror to, a, to another mirror here, and then through uh, a shutter, a filter wheel, and a detector. And you're going to find out why those are important when we go to take an image in just a moment. Um, 
in order to do this, you while I'm talking about this, actually, I know you're you're on your uh, laptop or you're watching this webinar. If you happen to have your phone with you, you can do this. What I'm showing you on screen on your phone as I'm talking to you about it. So the first thing you want to do is open up a browser and look for microobservatory.org. So microobservatory.org uh, is the website and the portal to the telescopes to take images that we're going to use today is our Observing with NASA portal, uh, microobservatory for everyone. It's free. You can request an image or 40 images every single day, and uh, you'll get them generally the next day uh, by email. How does it work? Let's try it out. So, uh, actually, when you, let me put, bring this into, when you, I'm gonna bring uh, actual website into the screen here. When you click on microobservatory for everyone, you get to the Observing with NASA homepage, and you'll see uh, some information about these astrophoto challenges. We'll get to that later in the webinar. But the first thing you want to do, since you want to control the telescope, uh, sorry, telescope um, tab. So if you click on that, you get to a page that has a list of several dozen targets. And you notice the targets are organized kind of the way space is organized. We have targets in the solar system, and we have targets beyond the solar system, but inside our Milky Way. So stars and star clusters, nebula, which are, which are giant clouds of gas and dust, and galaxies beyond uh, our Milky Way galaxy um, that you can take images of as well. So, uh, when you click on a, um, uh, an object, I'm going to uh, click on uh, the Hercules cluster here. Um, you're presented with three settings and you have to tell the telescope uh, what you want to, um, how you want it to take the picture. And astronomers do this with their space telescopes, with NASA space telescopes as well. First of all, you select a camera which typically has a certain field of view. And for the microobservatory uh, telescopes, the field of view is, the normal field of view is about a degree. And what that means is if I hold up my pinky at arm's length and you imagine a string from my eye to the top of my pinky fingernail and another string from my eye to the bottom of my pinky fingernail, that tiny little angle of that string is a one degree chunk of the piece of, of the sky. And that's the piece of sky that you'll get in your field of view. Just for reference, um, uh, the, the um, Hubble Space Telescope is, is kind of a hundred times smaller than that chunk of sky. So you, 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 uh, the Hubble Space Telescope gives you a nice high resolution view of a tiny chunk of the sky um, and you uh, get to see much more detail. So choose the field of view. Then your next setting, you're choosing the exposure time. There's a shutter that actually lets in light and uh, 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 for a certain period of time, the dimmer the object, the more light you want to let into the telescope. And in fact, uh, some of you may know for Hubble's deep field, those galaxies that are at the other end of the universe, the exposure time was days and days and days long. I'm not quite sure what it is, Carolyn, if you think of it, type it in the chat box, but it was a very long exposure time. And then the final thing you choose uh, is, do you want to have no fill? Do you want all the light you can get from that object that you're aiming at? Or do you want to ex find out whether there's more red light or more green light or more blue light? And so you want to use filters. Microobservatory has, has the option to choose a red, green, or blue filter. If you choose multiple, that just means you'll get one email with three images in it. One taken through the red, one taken through the blue, and one taken through the green. And just as a little experiment to show you what you're doing, 
when you take these uh, uh, filtered images. I actually am going to um, stop sharing my screen for a moment so that you see me. And uh, what you want to do is um, I'm going to aim my camera so you can see my uh, let me get that. There we go. So you can see my little computer screen next to me. And uh, uh, you'll see that my computer screen is emitting light. It's like objects in space. And it's uh, uh, kind of like a nebula that's glowing in different colors. There's part of the screen glowing red, part blue, and uh, part green, and part some other colors here. Uh, and so I want you to make a prediction, if you can, in the chat box really quickly. Make a prediction. I have a I have a, a colored filter wheel, just like is on the micro observatory telescope. I'm going to put it over the webcam, and when I do that, what's going to happen? What part? What will you see in our little uh, three color, quote unquote, nebula? Will you see the all three circles turn red? Will you see the red circle disappear? Will some circles, will, will this one turn brown or this one turn purple? If you have any pre uh, predictions, type them in the chat box. I'll wait just a moment. And if you're too shy to make a prediction, don't worry. Uh, I actually just did this activity with um, a PhD astrophysicist and they um, were surprised by what happened. So uh, <laughs> no worries. OK, so I guess at least someone says all three will turn red. Another says it will all be white. Here we go. We have red, green, and blue light coming towards the camera. We're going to put a red filter over the camera. Aha. Uh -huh. We have some, um, OK. So the red circles you can see, but the other two disappear. All right. That uh, seems cool. Yes, it's very cool. Uh, so let's think about what's happening. The red filter is only letting through. It's red, but transparent. It's only letting through red photons to the web camera, to you. So where are the red photons coming from? Well, in a computer screen, uh, you guys have probably, right, a computer screen is made of all these little red, green, blue pixels. And so there's all the red pixels of the screen are lit up there. Magenta actually has red and, um, red and blue, but the red, there are red photons coming from that. White, of course, has all the red, green, and blue pixels of the screen. So there's red coming through that and red coming from that. But in this part and in this part, there are no red photons. The screen is not shining in red light. So when I put the red filter, only the red light gets through, and you only see the part of our computer nebula here that is glowing with red photons, with red light. So now I have another prediction, and I bet you'll be much better at it. I'm going to just put the green filter between my computer nebula and the camera. What do you think you're going to see now? All right, here comes. Everybody's saying, just the green circle, just the green circle. All right. Well, yes. The green circle is brightest, but we also see a little bit of the um, blue circle. And that has more to do with this filter than it does with our computer nebula. This is not, this is kind of a broad band filter. It lets through, it lets through green light, but it also lets through a little bit of blue. And now for the blue. So we have the blue. Okay, and again, the blue lets through a little green light, so our blue, um, our blue emitting part of our computer nebula. So that's when you take a um, uh, an image with the telescope, you'll um, 
in order to create a natural color image, which we're going to do by the end of this webinar, you need um, to take images through multiple filters and combine them. The reason for this is the telescope detectors, which I'm going to bring back in here if I can find my, here we are. Wait, what happened to my, oh wait, share. Press that to share. Let's get back. Where is my, swipe it sideways. Flip your mouse sideways. I don't have that. I know I have it somewhere here. Let's see. Window. No. Window. There we are. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, the detector only sees in black and white. It only can detect are there a lot of photons coming or only a few. And so if there's a lot of photons coming from this part of the nebula and you have a green filter, you know that that's green. And this will make more sense when we get to that part of the webinar. Okay, so you've taken your, you've requested your image. The next screen, if you're doing it on your iPhone, if you hit continue, uh, asks for your email address and a little bit of information. So you enter that, click submit, and you will have sent your command to our telescope system. And now this evening in Arizona and in Cambridge, each telescope will swing into action with no human in the loop. Um, and it will uh, go through the night taking observations that were requested by users during the day. Tomorrow, uh, our, our computer system here at the Center for Astrophysics tends to send all the images out at 1.30 Eastern time. So that's when you get your email uh, with your image that you took the day before. So you can take an image of the moon every night, see the, uh, um, see the uh, phases changing. Might be a great thing for this summer of, um, uh, summer of space. Universal and story. 20th anniversary, uh, 20th, why do I keep saying that? That's 20th yeah. 50th anniversary of the Apollo landing. Um, you'll note that the telescopes sit out, they don't have a dome. Um, and they're weatherproof, they're actually sealed up, the opening is sealed up with plexi, so it lets light through. Uh, but if it's cloudy weather, you'll get a cloudy image, and so don't panic if your, your first try doesn't come out. Now you really know what it's like to be a ground-based astronomer and why we really love to have telescopes in space um, where you don't have these issues. Okay. The image that comes back in your um, email is going to uh, have a link to a web page like this. And uh, this web page uh, will have a little black and white, a little preview of your image. And I want to make sure you know that that preview d does not have all the detail. It, you'll see that it's, it, it uh, shows you uh, a little bit of your image, but you can bring out much more detail using image processing. And that's going to be the next part of the webinar. We're going to learn how to use uh, what we call our JS94L. And the story behind that is a little bit long, but the 4L means for learners. And the JS9 part is a professional, so, uh, professional astronomers use JS9 software, and we've adapted it for learners so that you, too, can enhance and analyze your images and turn them into beautiful color astrophotographs. Are there any questions that have come up? I'm just going to give a little wait time so people can think about questions, answer them in the question and answer box or the chat box. Carolyn and um, Erica will try to answer those questions for you. Uh, but I kind of wanted to give a pause because I know I've zoomed right along here. Um, I will note a lot of people ask, can we overwhelm the telescopes if we take too many images? And the way the system works, is if 
you have a thousand people at your library and they all ask for uh, an image of the moon at 0.1 seconds, we don't take a thousand images of the moon. We take one and we send it to a thousand email addresses. So uh, that's how we are able to have universal access. Anybody, we limit the number of targets, but uh, as many people as possible can choose from those targets. And the telescope will, um, yeah. oh, somebody said, <laughs> there will be a copy of these slides as well, made available to people on the, um, this is, you, we'll make sure that you know how to get a copy of these slides, so. There was another question there, Mary. Uh, yeah. They requested a picture of Saturn and only a blue filter was available. Why are some of the observations limited to certain filters? Ah, excellent question. Uh, why are some of the observations limited to only some filters? Um, we try to give early assured success for most images. Um, Saturn is actually difficult to observe with micro observatory. It's easy to overexpose. And um, it also shows up very tiny in your field of view. Uh, that's one thing. It's not the greatest telescope for planets other than the moon. Um, uh, because they, they, they appear as dots. When you look at textbooks and those beautiful pictures of planets, they are either from NASA missions that actually traveled to the planet, like Cassini, went all the way to Saturn to get those gorgeous images, or the Hubble telescope is, um, doesn't have so much atmosphere in the way and can get a pretty good image of Saturn, but, uh, the, the um, in microobservatory, it pretty much looks like a dot. We only offer a blue uh, um, filter for Saturn because it's the way to get at least the best uh, image. Mars offers a red and a green filter, and which do you think it's brighter in? You can probably figure that out based on the color of Mars, and those two filters allow you to make those that comparison. Great question. All right. Um, so uh, we have um, seen that when you take an image using a micro observatory, you are choosing settings. If you choose a wide field of view, you're actually using this finder camera. And um, if you choose the normal field of view, it goes through the normal aperture. You're choosing the shutter. That's this little blue area that opens and closes. You're choosing the filter, a filter wheel. And finally, the detector is detecting the number of photons that during the exposure time are focused onto a, a field of view that's 600 by 650 by 500 pixels, much smaller than your um, much fewer pixels than your iPhone, uh, but they are pixels that are really sensitive to really dim light. So our next, last, the last half of the webinar is gonna be dedicated to what do you do with those images when they come back and how do you process them, enhance them, and uh, make uh, beautiful astrophotographs. So for that, I'm actually going to bring in a live uh, website as well. So I'm going to bring um, that observing, uh, where is it here? Whoops. Oh, here we are. Oh, here we are. Okay. So uh, you, you, um, this is actually also something you can, if you have a particularly big phone, you can follow along on your phone while I'm demonstrating this, but you might just want to um, watch our video tutorials or this webinar again. So once you have your image back, and again, you've all gone through the process of choosing the filters, you put in your email address, and you hit submit. Whoops. Oh, whoops, that didn't work. Sorry. Uh, you hit submit. And it says tomorrow or the next day you'll receive email notification from microobservatory support. 
and your email will um, look like this. This is my email uh, from last week. I asked for the Triffid Nebula and I asked for multiple filters, red, green, and blue. And I'm going to um, click on my access my red filter image in my email. And I'm going to ask to view my image. There it is. And you'll see the telescope wasn't pointed exactly. It seems to be in the top hand, half of the field of view, but that's okay. I'm gonna view it in the JS9 software. So if I click on this link, the JS9 software will open with my image loaded. Okay, now um, you can also get to that software uh, on the Analyze Images tab on the website. So we went through the Control Telescope tab and the Analyze Images tab opens up this browser base. There's no software to download uh, uh, and you can open up your images in the software. There is a um, tour, a light box tour, that guides you through what to do with your image and uh, gives you a little guidance. But I'm gonna be your tour today. So I'm gonna close that up. <laughs> All right. You note that when you first look at the image, it, it doesn't look like much, okay? In fact, uh, the, um, it looks like a bunch of dots. This is the raw data, uh, and we haven't started to enhance it yet. If I zoom in and look at some of those dots, let's see, let's see, where, uh, there we go. You can see, I'm gonna zoom in even further. So these stars, here's some, I don't know if you can see, right here's a star, and when I stick my cursor over it, look right here. It's really each star, is imaged on a few pixels, and each pixel is a certain value, a brightness value. So that's really all an astronomical image is. It's a, uh, um, it's a square array of numbers indicating where the most photons were focused and where they weren't focused. So I'm gonna reset the zoom. Here's the trick to bringing out the most detail in your image the fastest. And this is kind of a, an astronomer's tip. So um, the first thing you want to do in JS9 is change the scaling from linear to log. Now, remember, there's a lot of numbers in these images. And so there is some math involved in image processing. Log scaling, the main thing to keep in mind is this. Log scaling enhances the dimmest parts of your image without over enhancing the bright parts. Okay, so it gives more numbers, gives more, more, more of a boost to the dim parts than to the bright parts. So I'm gonna click log. Ah, so now I start to see more in my image. But the problem is, not only have I enhanced uh, uh, the Triffid Nebula, but I've enhanced the dark background sky, because that's pretty dim too, although it's not zero. If I, uh, I want you to pay close attention, if I put my cursor up here in the upper corner, look right here, the pixel value is 307. If I put it way in this corner, it's 306, down here, 312, over here, it's 307, right? So it's not that no photons were coming from the background sky. There is light coming from the background sky. But in an image, you want to make that, you want to increase your contrast and set that to black. So here's how you do it. Once you find out those four corners, what their value is, pick the lowest value, oh, 302, that looks good, and set your low brightness limit to that value. 308. Hit return. Aha! 
my nebula now is very visible. So again, when, when this was way down, you couldn't see the contrast. You want to set that value to the low brightness to about what the background sky is. Then you can use these other adjustments, bringing the high brightness value down, kind of boosts all the brightness, right? The stretch and contrast really gives nice contrast. Okay, so now you can use your other adjustments. Well, uh, now that I've got a nice um, triffid nebula there, I might even want to zoom in on it a little bit. Now you can start to see individual pixels. But uh, now I want to give it some color. You'll notice we have a color menu bar. And uh, right now what we're going to do is sometimes called false color but uh, you could call it computer color, computer colorized, uh, or you can call it kind of computer paint by number. Each of these color maps chooses a different set of colors and then maps them to the brightness values inside the image, right? So this one, this is uh, warm, and so uh, you can see on the map down below any object that is over, you know, over 500 is white. And so all the stars, if I stick my cursor in the stars, they are white. The dimmer stars have a lower brightness value and they're kind of yellow or orange. And the nebula itself which is in the 300s, just above the background sky, up here, dark orange, and then the background sky, which we set at 302, is black. Okay, and so you can choose your own um, color palettes uh, and, and uh, Different, different color palettes will enhance different features of the image. So um, that's uh, uh, a lot of people ask, well, you know, why would, I, why would I want one color palette rather than another? It really depends on what you're interested in looking at in your image and whether you're interested in displaying it for aesthetic purposes. You're looking to make a certain aesthetic judgment or you're trying to enhance certain astronomical features. You want to really highlight these dark dust lanes in this nebula. And so this palette does it pretty well, but there might be some, like this one, I don't think you can see the dust lanes as well in this. So I would go back to what I had here where I can really see them extend. Uh, so it depends on uh, how you want to make your choices for um, looking at the image. Are there any questions about that? Any questions that came up? Um, yes. We just got a question on, uh, how did you pick the image you chose to start with? Does it matter which of the three uh, filtered images you use? I feel like I have a shill in the audience. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, uh, Right, in my email, I started with the red because it was on top. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, make note of the fact that for most objects in the sky, the, the, there's more red light coming through the filter and the, um, than there is green or blue. And so often it's the one with the best signal to noise. So that's one reason. But, this, but uh, the second reason is I'm about to actually show you how to make a natural color image of the Triffid Nebula by actually using these three uh, filtered images. And this is the same process when you see um, a Hubble telescope color images. Uh, 
the Hubble telescope has more filters than we have. I think there's 13 or something. Um, uh, ones that let very specific colors in and ones that are more like uh, microobservatory filters. But uh, the image first comes back in black and white and you have to work with it to create um, a color image. So let's go back to my uh, Trifid Nebula here. And I'm going to um, I'm going to go back and make it uh, grayscale, okay? And you'll remember this was the red image, the image that came through the red filter. Um, uh, if you didn't remember that, I will note that there is a um, the the image that you um, that come back from the telescope are this special format called FITS format. You see how it says the image displayed ends in .fits here. Uh, that's a special format that astronomers use, and it, uh, it, it, they like it because it comes with metadata. All the information about how the, how the object was imaged is in the, uh, is in the header. And so if I go to image, and I say display fits header. You can see all this information. The file name is Trifid Nebula. The date it was observed is April 25th. The, um, the uh, exposure time was 60 seconds. And down here you can see the filter is red. So if you forget what filter an image is and you have it open, you can always look in the, um, look in the fits header. All right, so we've got the red image open. I've enhanced it. And now I need to tell the software this is the red image. So I'm going to color it red. <clears throat> now I'm going to go back to my um, back to my green image and open that up. And actually, this is now going to be a little bit of a trick here. Instead of opening it in another JS9 window, I'm going to simply drag the link onto the one I'm working on. Okay? So now I have my green image. Remember to enhance, we log scale. Then we find the corners for the dark sky, 297. 298, so let's set the low brightness limit at 298. There it is. Now I'm going to bring the high brightness down, do a little bit of that stretch and contrast. Okay, I'm going to zoom once, which I did before. So I have, and what color was this? This was green. Now I'll do the same for the blue image in my email. Here's the blue. I have my blue image. I'm going to drag it into my JS9 window. I'm going to log scale, find the corners of the images. They're like 281. Let's set this low brightness limit at 281. Enter. There's not much blue light coming from the nebula, but let's see. I'll bring that high brightness and enhance it a little bit. We'll zoom once because we have for the other two. And now we'll color that blue. So now you see that I have uh, three Triffid images open. And if I go between them, there's the blue, there's the green, there's the red, red, green, blue. I'm going to close this nebula. This lagoon nebula is also in there in the background. but. Okay, so now comes the uh, special step. We've told the computer software, this is the red filtered image, this is the green one, this is the blue one, this is the one where red light came through, green light, blue light. Now, RGB mode is the control. Click RGB mode, and all three images are added together. But there's a problem. Can you see what the problem is? Right? The telescope wasn't aimed exactly at the same place for all three exposures. So we have to shift 
the red image up to get it to align with the others. Luckily, there's a tool in the tool menu called Shift. So I'll click on that. And I know that I'm on my red image because I see the red color map. The image that's active in uh, JS9 uh, is the one where you can see the color map. So let me shift up. I'm going to click this. As I click, you can see. OK, there we go. And now I need to go a little bit to the left. And now you can see the Trifid Nebula. This is the real colors coming toward. I love the Trifid Nebula. It's one of my favorite objects. First of all, because the nebula itself, there's a bunch of blue light at the top of it. That's uh, dust scattering blue light in the same way that the blue sky scatters sunlight. And then there's this big cloud of hydrogen that emits lots of red light down below. And then there's all these stars that are different colors. Look, there's really red, cool stars, and then there's some bright, bluer stars. All these stars in the image of different colors as well. Uh, and those are different colors because they're different temperatures. So color, this is a natural color image. Earlier we looked at a, uh, what's sometimes called a false color or computerized color. And I think Carolyn has talked a little bit about representative color and noting what you're representing, being, uh, being um, careful to know what you're representing when you're doing your image processing. There's lots of other ways to uh, enhance images in JS9. You can add text. So you can label your images. You can give it a jaunty angle here. There we go. And now you can save that image as a PNG. And we often do programs where students, there's my image, saved as a PNG um, file. And you can print it out, and you can post it, make an astrophotography exhibit. There's lots of, um, lots of things to do uh, uh, with the software. So this has been a brief introduction. I'm really sorry I had that uh, technical glitch in the middle of it all. Let me go back to my... Um, presentation here again. Um, and so again, the images we write, the images come back from the telescope as numbers, but the higher numbers get the, um, it, when you're in shades of gray, the higher numbers get the whiter colors, uh, the lower numbers get the darker colors. And so an image you can visualize an image using those color maps. Question, I'm not sure I quite understand what they're asking, but I think maybe okay. if we work it out together, we can figure out what they're All right. Now. Questions come in. So the question is, when we select multiple color filters, will the end result be the same as choosing three different colored filters and merging all three? Perhaps we can. Expand on that. Uh, when we, well, the end result is through merging all three. Okay, I want to I want to distinguish between these colors, which are not filters. These are color maps, paint by number. They're they're basically codes for what color to give to a certain brightness value. Filters are actual physical pieces of glass, or in this case, plastic, that are in the telescope and that let through only certain colors of photons. So, so what I just did with my Trifid, my three Trifid, I had three images that were taken through three different color filters. Um, and so that allows me to add all that signal, the blue signal, the green signal, and the red signal together to see what the Trifid Nebula is really emitting. If I just take the same image from the Trifid Nebula 
and I color it red, green, and blue, and it hasn't actually come through a red, a green, and a blue filter, but I just used the computer to do it, you won't get this at all. In fact, when you add them together, you'll get a black and white image of the Triffid Nebula. I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I actually answered your question or whether I interpreted it incorrectly, but um, uh, yeah. So in order to do what I just did, which is to um, create an image that gives us a hint of what colors are actually being emitted by the stars and gas in the Triffid Nebula. In order to figure out what colors are actually being emitted, since our eyes aren't sensitive to see it, and the telescope detector only detects black and white, we have to take an image that we know is the part of the nebula that glows red, an other image that we know is the part of the nebula that grows green, glows green, another image that we know is the part of the nebula that glows blue, and use the software to add all the, the red signal, the green signal, the blue signal together. Um, and if our, if our telescope did see in color, this is what it would see. Does that make sense? So I think I figured out the question. Ah. Can you go to the telescope interface for a second? Okay, yes, telescope interface. And Orion or another. All right, so here we are at Orion. Uh, yes. So you can individually select each filter, which will give you uh, three separate emails. Yes, if, right. You can, you can you, this is a convenience the multiple filter, so that in the same email, you get back the three images. You can, if you're only interested in the red image and you want to take multiple of them for some reason, you can just take the red, and then you can ask it, make another request for the blue, and they'll just all be in separate emails. Correct, and when you select all three, that allows you to do the three color image processing that Mary just did. Right. The natural color. Yes, right. The advantages exactly. That's what you meant. Okay, great. We've <laughs> we've answered the question. Excellent. Um, so uh, doing these um, uh, tasks. Hey, that's uh, our Joe. Yeah, exactly. Well, now, right. Uh, sorry. Wait, I have to change this to Hubble Science Imager. <laughs> Joe, who was once the Chandra science imager, is now the Hubble science imager. Adam. But the tools, JS9, and the uh, observing and taking multiple filter images through telescopes is exactly what professional astronomers do. Um, and in fact, uh, the Triffid Nebula, uh, here are a couple of Hubble images of the Triffid Nebula. And here's a micro-observatory image. And note that you see this nice dust lane here. You see, it's right there in the microobservatory image. So you get lots more pixels and lots more resolution with those space telescopes. And see this amazing, and actually you can blow this up much bigger than I have it in this slide. Um, uh, this amazing image is a little part of the nebula right here. So all the tools you learn are useful not only in astronomy, but in engineering, or if you're trying to do an energy audit of a house using infrared camera, you have to process the signal. Where is the most infrared emitting from this house? Oh, from the roof, you need insulation. Uh, how about this chip? Where is the most heat escaping from the chip? Well, you need to color code it. When you see weather maps, they're using image processing to create those weather maps. These are STEM skills that are useful in every field from medicine to uh, engineering and also, of course, in graphic design. So we hope that you'll use uh, microobservatory. And to end the uh, webinar, I want to encourage you, we'll um, uh, have this um, webinar available. In June and July, we're going to be um, opening NASA's Astrophoto Challenge, 
which is uh, an opportunity for you and your audiences to submit your images uh, uh, for review and get uh, possibly have them highlighted. This was our last challenge, which was in fall 2018. And our next one is gonna be in June and July. And the target's going to be the Whirlpool Galaxy. If I go back to my Observing with NASA uh, webpage, you'll see uh, you'll be able to click on the Astrophoto Challenge in June and July. There'll be instructions, a video, um, uh, instructions for how to participate in uh, Step one, capture. Step two, create. Step three, uh, uh, compare your microobservatory and NASA image. And step four, submit. I do want to note that in addition to using microobservatory data that you take yourself, our NASA's astrophoto challenges allow you to actually work with real NASA data, the FITS data that comes back from the NASA telescopes. So we hope you'll be interested in doing that. And um, uh, offering programs that where your students or uh, audiences, family audiences, this is great for adults and kids to do together. Um, here we have some uh, students using NASA data down in the lower left, their microobservatory data here. Here they're making astrophotography posters. Um, and uh, there's lots of programming, and we hope that you'll practice your microobservatory and image processing skills and come back for more uh, Girls Steam Ahead and NASA's Universe of Learning resources. So I think we're now ready for questions. Okay. 